Humankind's obsession with the supernatural is anything but new. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! For hundreds of years, we told stories of monsters and vampires. In May of 1897, Bram Stoker published his gothic horror novel, Dracula. A story of romance, lust, desire, and of course, the bloodsucker himself. Bram Stoker presents his character as a rich, charming, and sophisticated ladies' man with a desire to immigrate from Transylvania to England. Years later, in March of 1922, an unlicensed film by the name of Nosferatu, Symphony of Horror, hits German theaters. The release of Nosferatu and the events that followed truly shaped the future of the media industry, from one of the first lawsuits in the history of the medium to setting the path for one of the most important amendments to one of our most important laws. Fair use. We'll come back to that. But first, let me tell you about a young producer named Alden Grau. He was serving in the First World War when he heard local farmers talking about real-life vampires. Fascinated, once the war was over, he had decided to make a highly stylized and expressionistic take on Stoker's Dracula novel. He hired screenwriter Hendrik Galeen and director F.W. Murnau and founded Prouded Films, with big plans to continue making occult films after Nosferatu. Bram Stoker passed away in 1912, where his estate was being managed by his widow, Florence Stoker. The novel had already lapsed into public domain in the U.S. due to an error in copyright notice. Unfortunately for Alban Grau, in Germany, the book's copyright would still be honored for 50 years after the author's death. His production company had to get copyright approval before continuing with their adaption. It's unknown whether Grau and his company refused to pay for the rights or if Florence Stoker refused, but the approval wasn't granted. Unwilling to give up on his vision, Grau began pre-production. He took measures to avoid a lawsuit and a copyright snafu by making changes from the original. Unknowingly, he would be changing the way vampires would be perceived in the public eye forever. In 1922, Nosferatu had a huge debut in the Marble Hall of the Berlin Zoological Garden, and the audience was immediately enamored by its inventiveness and a uniquely eerie atmosphere. It proved that vampire movies actually had an audience and were profitable. However, they made one dire mistake on one of its publicity posters. Freely adapted from Bram Stoker's Dracula, this one mistake was the first nail in the coffin for this cult classic. Unfortunately for Pranda Film, that is not the end of our story. Florence Stoker, after seeing the poster from an anonymous source, persuaded the British Society of Authors to pursue a case against them. They sued, causing Pranda Film to file for bankruptcy in an attempt to escape from the lawsuit. Florence came out on top, and the German court ordered all copies of the film to be confiscated and destroyed. However, unlike the creature depicted in the movie, Nosferatu rose from its grave. A print showed up in France. A slightly altered one was being shown in Germany under the name The Twelfth Hour in the early 20s, and prints showed up in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the United Kingdom, and the United States by the end of the 20s. Florence, while she couldn't take legal action in every country, made every effort she could to destroy it. After seven years of being shelved in America, it premiered in 1929 and was immediately declared a masterpiece of cinema. The US had many successful screenings of the film and she considered it a threat to ongoing negotiations with Universal Studios. However, it's believed that because of the success in America, Universal decided to make the deal. In 1931, Miss Stoker authorized Universal Studios' as Dracula, attempting to take Nosferatu out of the limelight. Universal bought up the last few copies of Nosferatu they could find. They told the owners of the prints that they were going to be destroyed. However, they decided to study it for their own film. Once again, Nosferatu rose from the grave. By dumb luck, one more copy showed up in the US. And due to the mistake in Dracula's copyright, there was nothing Florence could do about it. By the 1960s, the book's copyright had lapsed across the rest of the world, and Nosferatu was finally able to make its journey home. 
Now, it sits with an 8 out of 10 on IMDb and is considered one of the best and most influential horror movies of all time and a staple of vampire lore. There is irony here too, since Nosferatu is in many ways a more truthful adaptation of the original novel compared to recent attempts. Now, copyright law has changed and evolved in a way that benefits the creators of media content. With the induction of the fair use law, creators have a lot more freedom in working with copyrighted content. Even now, recent lawsuits have ended up favoring the creators instead of the copyright owners. This is partially due to Nosferatu's success. I swear to God, it felt like this would never happen. Nosferatu's legacy carries on even today, with its sequel Nosferatu in Venice in 1988, Shadow of the Vampire in 2000, a remake that takes place on the set of the original film. And there's even a Spongebob Squarepants episode, Graveyard Shift, featuring Count Orlock. Now, a new Nosferatu remake is in the works, directed by Robert Eggers and published by Universal. Nowadays, the vampires of cinema are descended from one of two forefathers. Bram Stoker's suave, handsome, and even romantic womanizer, or Nosferatu's distorted and twisted depiction. One of the biggest changes from Dracula to Nosferatu was the ending. In Nosferatu, Count Orlok is vanquished by sunlight, while in the original, sunlight was harmless to vampires. This idea carried over into tons of vampire movies, including those officially carrying Dracula's name. This and countless other themes transferred over into the common vampire canon, in the end, it's ironic that many of the elements of modern vampire lore descended from a failed attempt to avoid a copyright lawsuit, and it's likely that without it, there might not have been any vampire movies at all. <laughs>